Good afternoon. Welcome to our show. I'm Melissa Ridgen, and today we are going behind the scenes on a massive water project that APTN is involved with. Uh, you've likely seen some of these stories roll out already this week. We are putting clean water, broken promises in focus. That's the name of this series. It pulls together two years of incredible research, data analysis, and good old-fashioned legwork involving six media outlets, ten universities. Uh, and at the heart of it is something I think everybody knows. You know, many First Nations in this first world country do not have access to clean drinking water. But why? You know, back in 2015, Justin Trudeau, of course, campaigned on a promise to get clean drinking water to every single First Nation. You know, at the time, hundreds were on long-term boil water advisories. Well, it's 2021. The Liberal self-imposed deadline to have this done is actually next month. They now say that that is not going to happen. They're not even close to reaching that target, uh, despite spending $1.6 billion to do so. This water, water project does a, a deep dive into how that money hasn't solved the problem. What are the failings and where do we go from here? You can add your voice to the conversation, of course. You can call us toll-free, 1-877-647-2786. Well, let's get started with one of the stories in the Clean Water Broken Promises series. This is by APTN's Brittany Hobson. 26 years and counting. That's how long Nishkandaga First Nation has been on a boil water advisory. The longest in the country. That was supposed to change when the federal government announced in 2015 the Oji Creek community in northwestern Ontario would be getting a new water treatment plant. But what followed was years of construction delays evacuations and broken government promises. You hate to see uh, your uh, relatives, your children, your future living in this condition and there seems to be no end. It's one problem after another. During this time residents have been evacuated twice due to problems with their water supply. So far, the federal government has spent $16.4 million on this one project. But Chief Chris Munez says residents still can't drink the water. I've seen a three-year-old this, this spring, while the, everything was still, while, 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 while uh, there was uh, snow on the ground, the lake was frozen, dragging a sleigh to get reverse osmosis water. That's heartbreaking. When Justin Trudeau was elected in 2015, he promised to eliminate all long-term boil water advisories by 2021. The government has invested in hundreds of projects across the country in order to keep that promise. But some communities allege they are dealing with shoddy work, adversarial relationships with contractors and engineering firms, and a government approach, they say, prevents them from hiring companies they trust. Joining us now is Annie Burns Piper, the managing editor of the Institute for Investigative Journalism at Concordia University. She's here to tell us how this massive undertaking all came together and what it means in the grand scheme of things when we're talking about water. Annie, thanks Hi. for joining us. Hey. This is an exciting, exciting week for you as you're watching all of this roll out. It's like, you know, having a baby. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so it should be noted that Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller actually brought this uh, up today, actually at a press conference. He called this reporting excellent. Uh, you know, him and his department, uh, the Liberal government, don't exactly shine in all of this. Uh, but you know, what do you what do you make of his appreciation for this for this work? Well, it was definitely cool to see, and, and particularly cool to see um, the minister recognizing some of the students that have worked on this uh, reporting. Mm -hmm. um, he mentions them specifically. I think, um, you know, as much as we appreciate the compliment, um, we're, we as reporters are very interested to see what the government does next after um, after sort of seeing the gaps that we've exposed. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, the pat on the back is not uh, is, is not enough. You know, on APTN National News, we, you know, we've got into the whole who, what, when, where, and a bit of the why on this issue. Uh, but today, you know, I kind of want to get more into the why and the how. Uh, sort of the machinery of this massive project, how it all came together. Uh, the Institute for Investigative Journalism has been investigating problems uh, with regards to water quality uh, across the country since 2018. But how did it evolve into uh, this, this hard look at First Nations water issues? 
Well, yeah, as, as you mentioned last year, we did um, a large scale investigation as well into that primarily looked at lead in drinking water. And, and what um, I wasn't with the Institute at that time, but what my colleagues found was that there wasn't enough information on First Nations. And um, so we, we started working on a project that would look specifically at um, issues on First Nations. And uh, we worked with universities across the country um, including First Nations University and, and a class um, led by uh, Professor uh, Patricia Elliott. And she, she sort of laid the groundwork for how we um, ended up doing this investigation. Um, her students were researching uh, the history of water quality in different communities. And um, sort of out of that work, we developed a water operator survey, which was a standardized list of questions that students across the country asked uh, water plant operators uh, to sort of delve into their own um, experiences um, and work um, on the front lines of, of the water crisis. Mm. Um, and that was the, sort of the impetus for a lot of our storytelling. Well, and we're going to talk later in the show to two of the students who are involved in that, right from uh, you know kind of the beginning of this project. You know, most of the project uh, was done during the COVID pandemic. What challenges did that bring? Yeah, absolutely. So that sort of hit right as um, students were in, uh, you know, in their semesters working on these surveys. And so uh, it, it created disruption and the research process as, as classes were canceled and students were sort of in the middle of doing these interviews. But then as the investigation went on, um, we had planned to do a lot of travel and visit, you know, visiting some of the communities that we we're covering. But, um, you know, ultimately a lot of this work had to be done over the phone and on Zoom. And uh, we didn't, you know, get to sort of build relationships in the same way we would have liked to. And so that obviously uh, was a hurdle. Um, but, um, you know, we overcame that. I think, um, you know, we it was just sort of persistence on the uh, the part of uh, all of the reporters who, who took part um, in sort of getting to know people as best they could on the phone by, you know, by social media and, and many other ways. So. Well, I think that's, I mean, I remember when the pandemic hit, lots of us were like, well, I guess I can't do these stories anymore. It didn't matter what type of story you're working on. There's that initial thing that, you know, journalists were like, well, we can't go go and tell this story. And then it was funny how quickly we found new ways to tell the stories, found ways around getting around, not being able to travel and, and have in-person meetings with people. Um, you know, in the midst of all of this, too, the poster child uh, for this, for Badwater, uh, Niskantica First Nation, of course, in northern Ontario, um, they were kind of propped up by the by the federal liberals as like you know we're, this is who we want to help. 25, 26 years, uh, they've been uh, had not have had have had access to clean drinking water. Um, you know they're in the middle of your investigation. Their water treatment plant uh, has issues again. The community is evacuated. You know at that time, what, walk us through what everybody in this project was thinking as this all blows up and then you know you, there, this is kind of ongoing. But then all of a sudden it's getting is back on you know national headlines uh, for yet another water problem. What, what was going through the the consortium's head? Well, you know, it was interesting because we were actually already looking at um, Nishkantika First Nation and and the history of the contractor that uh, was originally hired to build their water treatment plant. And it's sort of as you saw from Brittany's story, uh, we had uh, we'd already been sort of looking at this for several months when uh, the community was evacuated. And so we had a good basis for our reporting, but we had to pivot and do things a bit quicker than we had anticipated. So we had stories uh, starting to come out um on the the crisis there in november and and uh we continue that's been continuing on until um these last couple of weeks when we've had our sort of a uh, major rollout mm -hmm. uh, but um yeah i remember that i was actually had been trying to get a uh, hold of chief munias for some time and when i finally got him on the phone he said um you know our community is evacuating tomorrow and, and mm -hmm. that was that was, you know, Tess, it's like time, time to get going on this reporting. So, yeah, you know, um, you know, in the midst of all of it, there's there's so much effort uh, and energy and, and hard work that went into it. But what was is there something that was most surprising or intriguing to you, um, like a kind of an aha moment or a holy crap moment in all of this? Well, I think in working with Brittany on the story that you, you, you just uh, shared, um, I was really interested to see that the, the even though the federal government is pouring billions of dollars into new water treatment plants, there seems to be no oversight of how uh, these projects are working out and how the firms that are hired are actually 
doing in terms of how they're treating uh, communities, how uh, how uh, good their work is. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that was quite shocking. It seems like basic common sense. You know, if you hire someone for a job at your home, if they don't do a good job and they don't treat you well, you don't invite them back. Right. Uh, but it seemed, you know, that, you know, on these multi-million dollar projects across the country, uh, there was no one sort of tracking the performance of these firms. And, and, and that, that I found was quite surprising. Uh, you folks at the Institute for Investigative Journalism have a tip line. Tell us about that. How does that work? How can people get a hold of you? Yes. Um, so uh, we have an email um, uh, that we can share with you. Um, it's uh, tips.iij at protonmail.com. And um, we would love if people have any more information on um, engineering or contracting firms doing any type of infrastructure project on a First Nation. If they have information about um, how those projects are going and want to share it with us, uh, they can write us at that uh, email. And I'm the one checking it. So I will be uh, reading anything you send. Well, Annie, thank you for taking the time to share all of this with our In Focus audience. Uh, hopefully, we're bringing them up to speed of what's going on. This massive project uh, is something that a lot of people have to be proud of. You, the glue keeping this all together, Annie, hats off to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have to take a break, but when we come back, we talk to Tom Fenario and Brittany Hobson, two of the APTN staffers who worked on this project, and we see some of what they uncovered in this investigation, including why $1.6 billion has not solved a thing. Stay with us. Join our conversation now. Call in toll-free at 1-877-647-2786. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN In Focus, and send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. Welcome back. Let's go to social media now with our social media editor, Jesse Andrushko, to hear what some of you are saying about clean water broken promises. Thanks, Melissa. Online, we asked what your thoughts were on the water issues in First Nations, as well as what the situation was in your community. We got a lot of feedback. Let's take a look. First from Jay. I've lived on three reserves as a child. I suffered kidney damage due to nitrates in the water. Today, I have compromised immunity and for several years would get strep throat every month due to bacteria getting in my mouth while showering. We tape our noses closed to shower now and brush our teeth with bottled water. Rhonda said, more failed promises on behalf of our federal government over and over and over again. Tyler commented, I live in Kisikunin. We have a water plant, but four jugs per household isn't enough, especially when you have a baby and cannot bathe or wash his bottles in the tap water. It's a golden color after it's touched heat, not to mention I was told even our bottling plant water isn't the cleanest to begin with. From Agnes, so sickening that so many communities do not have potable water in their homes. Water is not a luxury, it is a necessity of life. Dent said, a big part of the problem is underfunding which results in operator burnout, technical problems beyond their scope, parts hard to source, couriers don't go to the res, no credit from suppliers. I work in this field and it's not rewarding. Lastly from Victoria, they throw government scraps and expect a handful of crumbs to solve all the infrastructure problems. They built a system where, where the Indigenous are entirely dependent on their government for everything and they are hated for centuries by the non-Indigenous for it. And it was by no mistake they made it this way. Thank you to everyone who shared their thoughts. If you want to share your opinion on First Nation water issues, here's how. Join our conversation now. Call in toll-free at 1-877-647-2786. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN In Focus. And send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. As mentioned, the federal government has spent $1.6 billion trying to fulfill a 2019 election promise to provide clean drinking water to all First Nations. It's not worked. They have said uh, that their self-imposed deadline to fix the water woes on reserve by next month is not going to happen. Now these ongoing water problems uh, are, have been compounded, of course, by a pandemic that nobody saw coming. How, how so? Here's a look at another piece by our own Brittany Hobson.
Whenever Lisa Raven makes a three-hour drive from her home in Hollow Water First Nation to Winnipeg, she brings these water jugs to fill up. That's because her family is one of dozens in the Anishinaabe community who lack access to clean spite extensive infrastructure upgrades from the federal government. Raven gets her water from a large tank or cistern that's connected to her home. I mean, I, I certainly don't want to drink uh, the water that's in our holding tank. I don't even give, like, our dogs. The federal government invested more than $9 million to upgrade the community's water treatment plant. Hollow Water was put on a boil water advisory in 2016 after dealing with ongoing breakdowns at the outdated plant. Indigenous Services Canada lifted the advisory two years later, calling the investments a success. But Chief Larry Barker is not satisfied with the solution. He says the federal government did not provide the funds to pipe water to every home. The government is wrong when they, when they fixed a boil water alert for haul of water. I hear it all over being presented by the feds and I tell them no because you did not, you did not complete the water line. There are about 50 homes in the community who use water tanks. Leadership tells them to keep boiling their water. Thousands of people across Canada rely on cisterns for their water. APTN and its partners spoke with residents, leadership and researchers who believe these systems have serious physical and mental health impacts on those forced to use them. Delivery trucks transport water from the treatment plant where it is placed inside a large holding tank connected to a resident's home. This method poses major concerns around water quality. You could have contamination with the hose at the, at the treatment plant if it's not properly guarded and, and disinfected. You could have contamination because the truck is dirty. And in extreme cases? There's, there's issues of some of our cisterns being cracked and infested with uh, you know, snakes and you know, rodents. Cisterns require regular cleaning, which can be costly and time-consuming. In hollow water, Raven says her tank hasn't been cleaned in nearly eight years. If you're putting that clean water into, you know, a dirty tank, then it kind of defeats the purpose of that. Barker says the funding is just not there to clean them regularly. The water coming out of Kathy Bjork's taps runs clear for the first time in decades, but she still won't drink it. A cistern was recently installed in her home in hollow water after years of using raw river water. I mean, common sense would tell you, even if it is treated water, like say you leave a jug of water in, the, in a plastic jug for too long in the fridge, even that would get slimy. If you don't dump it, rinse it, or even clean it, clean the jug, you know, it's just common sense to me. Sutina Nation in southern Alberta is facing a similar situation. The federal government invested $14.2 million into the design and construction of a new water treatment plant completed in 2019. However, 60% of the homes still do not have access to piped water. Leadership says the money was to address water concerns at the school, and there was not enough to pipe water to every home with a cistern. Kylie McGinnis lives in a home with 11 others. She says her cistern hasn't been cleaned in years. The only time you see me drinking the water is when it's boiled, like when I have tea or if it's from the fridge. She says requests for her cistern to be cleaned and tested have gone unanswered by the nation. McGinnis's water was tested for bacteria as part of this series and the results came back negative. This news provided some relief, but she says it doesn't change things. It's not just what's in her water that concerns McGinnis, it's also how much is coming out of the taps. Residents say they often have to ration water out of fear of running out. In some communities, water delivery may only come once a week, meaning families have to make sacrifices. Do I want to do laundry or do I want to have a bath today? <laughs> so it's like, you need to pick and choose here. 
Well, that is just a bit of the piece it airs in its entirety. Tune in to APTN National News tonight for that. Joining me now is Brittany Hobson herself in the flesh. Uh, and joining us from Montreal is Tom Fenario. Thank you, guys. Uh, I'm so happy that you could both be with us. So, Brittany, I'll start with you. you know, at, at what point uh, of this project did you become involved? Um, so it was about this time last year, actually, and I was just thinking about it because it was the last trip that I took pre-pandemic <laughs> uh, to Montreal where we got to a bunch of APTN reporters and global reporters got to go to the Institute for Investigative Journalism at Concordia and meet a lot of the students that were involved in this. And um, originally when I came on, it was actually, uh, there wasn't really anything set up for Manitoba. I kind of came on to help with Saskatchewan coverage. But in Manitoba, like the numbers, especially relating to cisterns, um, they're pretty much the highest in Manitoba. A lot of northern communities have cisterns, so we kind of took a look and said, well, no, we should be covering something here in Manitoba. So I kind of uh, started digging into what was going on here uh, last spring. Uh, so, Tom, we'll see a story from you in a little bit, but, uh, you know, producing a story wasn't the only role uh, in this investigation that you had. You were working with the Institute of Investigative Journalism as well. Yeah, I had um, weekly meetings with the folks, including Annie, who was, uh, you spoke to uh, before the last commercial break. Um, I guess what we're doing here right now is sort of the, the glamorous, kind of sexy side of television, talking <laughs> in front of the camera. You know, but really, uh, what the folks at the institute did really well is they um, they just sort of did all the legwork. They did a lot of the phone calls, the emails, the access to information requests that are so important to grid journalism. They wrangled all of the students' uh, information and uh, data into like a functional thing for me to take and just sort of humanize into a story for our viewers to sort of understand and grasp the major outlines of what the issues and problems are. So. Uh, yeah, lots of credit to the folks at the Institute, and uh, it there was, was great a to be lot part of, it. of. I mean, the journalists, the amount of work that the journalists did, the the data analysis, the researchers, the Institute, the students themselves. I mean, this was a massive undertaking. Like I was saying to Annie earlier, uh, a lot of people have a lot of a lot to be very proud of. Uh, Tom, I'll ask you: Was there um, a big aha or holy crap moment that uh, that hit you in the midst of all of this? Oh, sorry, was that for me or Brittany? Yeah, sorry, for you. I'm going to ask Brittany the same thing. <laughs> I would say that um, for me, there's lots of ahas. Canada has acknowledged for like 13 years that the maintenance of First Nations water infrastructure is underfunded. Uh, many infrastructure assets are not reaching their full life expectancy due to a lack of maintenance. And the money, it has to come from somewhere. So other, you know, sometimes it comes from essential services like housing, uh, sometimes it comes from like, you know, uh, you have to fix the pipes underground, but they don't get fixed because you have to spend money on clean drinking water. Clean drinking water is an essential service and you can't just let it slide. Um, another big thing for me was the parliamentary budget officer, uh, a division of the federal government, like came out and estimated that the federal funding amounted to only about 40% of what First Nations needs. And that doesn't even include factors like population growth. So and that's just, just a few of the things that I came across in yeah. this reporting. Brittany, same question. Was there some, oh my God, moments in, uh, in this for you? Something that you uncovered that was, you know, delicious mm -hmm. bombshelliness? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there were a few. Um, just coming on this as someone that hasn't really covered water issues as much, um, but just has heard about the extensive issues with it. I think for me, the first one um, kind of was with the first story that we aired looking at the procurement policies. Um, I came on at the tail end, a lot of the legwork was done by the IAJ and Annie, um, but I, I came on to help on uh, APTN's end, and for me the biggest thing was that the government does not track complaints made against contractors, <laughs> which I found ridiculous, um, because if you have a contractor that is consistently doing bad work, but is consistently get awarded bids, um, like you think that there it's would be some sort stunning. of mechanism to stop that from happening because there's what six over 600 first nations across mm -hmm. the country like i mean someone needs to be doing that tracking and if the federal government is the one that's handing out the money yeah. it, I, it should fall on their end but they really put that responsibility on first nations themselves which just to me was a little bit ridiculous. One of the things that um, struck me in watching uh, some of the stories that have come out on this too is the, the amount of money that's spent on these projects. And it's like, of course, everything has to go to the lowest bidder. 
and then you give it to the lowest bidder, you're not tracking to see how these companies oftentimes are, are operating, like you said. Uh, but then there's all these cost overruns, too, that's not factored in. It's like, well, why, what's the point of going to the lowest bidder if there's consistently cost overruns, too? Like, why wouldn't you look at a better way to do it? Um, you know, $1.6 billion, people likely think, you know, there's no way that that's not enough to, to at least put a big dent in this um, problem. Um, what did each of you uncover about why? I mean, you, you touched on it a little bit, that the, the money's not, there's no marks for, for measuring, um, you know, if it's working, right? Uh, but Tom, I'll, I'll go to you first. You know, what, what, what would be the answer that you would give to people who say, well, 1.6 billion, why isn't it fixed? I guess at its essence, we're talking about uh, often cases decades, decades of like mismanagement, decades of not giving enough money, and it just adds up, and it adds up to the point where we're at now, where it, this needs to be addressed. And unfortunately, it's not as simple as just throwing some money at infrastructure, then checking it off your to-do list and saying, oh, that, we solved that problem. Mm -hmm. It's not just about creating a new water treatment plant or a new wastewater treatment plant. It's about making sure there's long-term funding in place that's dependable, that will make sure this infrastructure doesn't rot and just become a problem all over again in five years. Right, and so I guess that's what it comes down to. Well, and there's there's not the funding for the, the operations and maintenance. Isn't that part of what this was, this uncovered, Tom? Yes, um, basically, and um, part of it is like I don't want to get too much into the nitty gritty uh, for folks here, but uh, there's a, there's a funding formula that's been in place for a really long time. I think since the late '90s was the last time it was looked at, and it's basically obsolete. Uh, sometimes it takes into account you get more funding if you have a large water treatment plant, like so they do it by square foot, but with technology now it doesn't need to be large, so you lose money if you have a smaller treatment plant, but that doesn't make sense because mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't, it's not reflective of population. So they basically need to look at this new operations and, ma and maintenance, or O&M as the people call it, mm -hmm. policy, and they need to change the new policy. And since 2019 they've been talking, by they I mean uh, Indigenous Services Canada, They've been talking about changing it, but it hasn't been done yet. So I think that's it starts there. It starts with those little nitty gritty details of how do we actually uh, judge what the proper amount is to give so we don't lose infrastructure so it doesn't just become a problem all over again in five years. Totally. And that, that same question could, could be extended to a whole bunch of things, housing, uh, other infrastructure. Brittany, um, we, just in, in talking before, um, you know, this whole, I think a lot of people were like, oh, you just have to end the boil water advisories and then the problem is solved. That's not, in fact, the case. So share uh, your thoughts on that. Well, yeah, and I think that, and as many have said this, that the Trudeau government, you know, when they've come in and, and looking at clean water, they really are only looking at it under the lens of ending long-term boil water advisories. Mm -hmm. But there are n a myriad of water issues going on in communities that aren't related to long-term boil water advisories. There's communities that are frequently on short-term boil water right. advisories, but they don't necessarily fall within this. There's communities that are getting plants that they don't need, plants mm -hmm. that they can't operate because of the OMM funding or lack of funding like so there are communities that are getting things that seem good on paper but aren't necessarily tailored to each individual nation's needs so it's just like throw money at things essentially right? hope, hope that it's fixed but as we're seeing I mean if it was fixed we wouldn't have had this this water project to roll out right um, you know, I'm th thoughts from you, uh, you know, as you're watching this all roll out, what do you hope the public takeaway is from this? I hope that um, people have a better, a little bit of a better understanding, because mm. frequently we're seeing um, people just asking why. Why is this continuing to happen? And mm -hmm. I think that there is no easy answer. Yeah. It is complex and historical. I mean, we're dealing with a department that it's now referred to as Din Indigenous Services Canada, but <laughs> it's a decades-old department that for a long time and, and still to this day is not listening to what First Nations need. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I hope that they get a bit of a better understanding, and I hope that they also realize that, you know, this large amount of money really, like, doesn't amount to much in the end. Yeah. Well, it hasn't been used properly. And we see that, I mean, that's the, that's the, the fault of government, I think, too. Okay, so let's go now. Tom, we're going to go, uh, and I'll say thanks to you guys both, because we're, after watching Tom's story, we'll go to a break. But uh, thanks to both of you guys for taking time to uh, share your thoughts 
on this, uh, your involvement in this massive undertaking. Kudos to you guys both, like amazing work. Um, we're going to go now to Tom's piece. Uh, as many First Nations across the country are in various states of getting improved drinking water, one Algonquin First Nation in Quebec has discovered that having new infrastructure, which we were just talking about, uh, is only the first step. Let's watch. Throws. Just because Terry Perrier is the manager of Public Works for Kabawik First Nation doesn't mean he's above working outside the sewage treatment plant in the middle of a blizzard. Not that he has much choice. He's one of three certified water technicians for his community. Here he is doing a monthly task, a color, fetching some water. effluent. Almost looks like lemonade. Effluent is what wastewater becomes after treatment to remove harmful bacteria. After a quick test, this effluent will be put back into the lake from where it once came. And the cycle of clean water management will begin anew. I've been involved in the water field within this community since the day I was hired in uh, August 95. Oh, we're right at point one on that filter. That's high today. Ask Perrier to explain his job there, and it breaks down into dozens of little tasks. Some need to be done every day. Some need to happen once there. every few months. All are necessary to make sure his community has clean drinking water. Right now, I can't show you my uh, residential flow meter because it broke. Minor inconveniences aside, Kabawik is the first to admit that they are better off than a lot of First Nations in Canada. Their water treatment plant is just 10 years old, while well, their wastewater treatment plant was built in 2017. But that doesn't mean the Algonquin First Nation doesn't have their struggles. My program runs in deficit every year, and I get, you know, called on it by our administrator, but I, I tell her, what do you want me to do? I said, I have services to provide. I mean, you want your streets plowed, you want your streets sanded, you want your streets cleaned in the spring, you want the storm drains to run, you want the water to flow, you want the sewage to, you know, be treated. All of that costs money. I, I said, which one of those do you want me to stop providing? No, and she has no answer, and I have no answer, so we just keep doing what we're doing. Located in northwestern Quebec, Kabawik is part of an assembly of First Nations study that looked into public works budgets across the country. An independent evaluator concluded that Kabawik should have a budget of nearly $1.3 million for operations and maintenance, commonly referred to as O&M. Their O&M budget is currently around 500000 Chief Lance Heyman says the study shows what he's long known. We should not be subject to, you know, having to do it less, nor should any other community in Quebec or across this country continually be expected to do more with less. That's just not realistic. It doesn't meet the needs, and it also leads to, you know, rapid deterioration and breakages in the systems that we have. Perrier says a major consequence of the lack of O&M funding is the preservation of important infrastructure falls by the wayside. For example, it's considered good practice to use special cameras to inspect hard-to-reach sewers. But Kabawik doesn't receive enough O&M funding from Ottawa to do camera inspections as frequently as they should. Meanwhile, Perrier has reason to believe his sewers need checking. Back in the late 90s, during a camera check, he discovered some decades-old shoddy work from contractors. They cut out the top of the sewer pipe so the water pipe could pass by and they covered in a garbage bag. Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller is well aware of the criticism his department has received regarding O&M funding. Last November, Indigenous Services announced an additional $660 million over six years for water and wastewater O&M funding. It's a signal to communities that over the long term we'll partnership with them and um, a good chunk of that money addresses 100% uh, commitment of the federal government to operations and maintenance. By 100% commitment, Miller is referring to changing the old funding model, which saw First Nations obligated to pick up 20% of the cost of O&M, a policy that dates back to the 1980s. In 2017, Minister of Indigenous and Northern Affairs Carolyn Bennett and AFN National Chief Perry Belgard agreed in a joint statement that the O&M policy is outdated and does not reflect First Nations needs. Heyman says taking into account the needs all across Canada, the proposed new funding model is woefully inadequate. We appreciate the extra funds, but nowhere near what we need. And with that extra funds comes added responsibility in terms of being solely and fully responsible for your systems. 
if they're going to follow through with their plan to provide 100% of funding, it has to be based on 100% of a real amount, a real projected amount that can be verified by a third party. And so Kabawik finds itself gearing up for negotiations, where they hope the shortfall of about $800,000 from their study can be used as leverage. Perrier says he's used to it. He just hopes it's sorted sooner rather than later. It took us approximately eight years to, to get from the point of originally asking for a brand new drinking water plant to the time we actually received the funding. That's how long it took us. In the meantime, Perrier's daily battle to keep clean water flowing will continue because the cycle of water treatment waits for nothing, bureaucracy included. Tom Fenario, APTN National News, Kabawik, First Nation, Quebec. As mentioned at the beginning of the show, this massive water project looking at First Nations water issues took root with the work of some First Nations University students in Regina. When we come back, we have two of those students joining us. Stay with us. Welcome back. Our maritime reporter, Angel Moore, was also involved in this water investigation, and she found that First Nations water operators are often overworked and underpaid. But in the Atlantic region, a group of First Nations has come up with a possible solution. Here's Angel's story, which includes work from the University of King's College. I can check. I can tell. Being a water operator is not a nine to five job. Many are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Every day, chlorine levels, filters, and pumps need to be checked in order to ensure safe drinking water. Greg Brewer is the water operator for his community, Tobik First Nation in New Brunswick. He says his team is responsible for about 400 houses. You know, one of the things that keeps me up at night is we're running on a, on a, uh, on a system here on our water that is over, you know, it's, it's, it's over 30 years old. And uh, what, we, what we do is we're, we're, you know, we're adding houses all the time, which we have to, to accommodate the population. Brewer is the only certified operator and is always on standby, including holidays. People like him are the last line of defense for clean water and he makes about $20 an hour. But Brewer says he has bigger problems than salary. The one thing that I see is that the community keeps growing, but the budget's staying the same. It's not reflecting on the growth of the community, which I see as a problem. An internal presentation from Indigenous Services Canada obtained by our investigation says $9.7 billion is needed over a decade to operate, maintain and repair infrastructure and Indigenous Services Operations and Maintenance Policy has not been updated since 1998. First Nations use funding provided under that policy to pay operators wages. Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller announced last December additional funding for over $1.5 billion for safe drinking water. That includes accompanying communities in the long term for their their water needs the training and operation of of local community community members that are highly qualified highly skilled Concordia's University Institute of Investigative Journalism and other media outlets surveyed 122 First Nations and found two-thirds of First Nations water operators earn less than the median wage of other operators in their province Rhonda Knockwood, Director of Operations for Sebaganagati First Nation in Nova Scotia, says keeping qualified staff is a challenge. I know that our operators have been approached many times by different municipalities in Halifax Water to, to go work, and he would be making at least a 50% wage increase um, with his Level 2 certification. Um, that's a concern, and we have to make sure that we find ways to keep our, our staff satisfi satisfied and continue working in our, in our community. Sebaganagati First Nation is a growing community with over 1,200 people. Chief Sack says sometimes the water operations and maintenance costs are paid with their own revenue sources, which are in short supply. 
which leads to difficult choices for Chief Mike Sack. That money that should be going to the people for their needs, we need to put it into our O&M, our housing, our, you know, all of our departments just to ensure that there's enough to run those um, departments with capacity. And even then, we're still you know, paying our main water operator not enough money. So it's, um, it's hard for us to keep you know, good staff around, and um, we're grateful that they are here. Halifax water operator Kara Baisley says she would not want to do her job for less than she makes now. The water plant serves more than 100,000 people. So for my position as a level four operator at a level four facility for drinking supply of um, half of Halifax, um, no, I would not want to work at minimum wage. There is a lot of pressure, a lot of expectation. Um, since 2015, Indigenous Services has committed more than a billion dollars to address the water crisis. But in our survey, First Nations water operators reported there is not enough money for operations and maintenance. In 2020, Atlantic First Nations Water Authority, an Indigenous-led initiative, developed their own water management model. The Water Authority is developing a long-term approach. Carl Yates is the interim CEO. So we want to take it from that kind of reactive approach of getting funding, you know, year to year. So let's start looking at least, you know, 25 years out to say what do we need for a sustainable approach. So a framework for that is what we're really focused on. The Water Authority, or AFNWA, expects it will receive more funding than what communities have received on their own. So far, AFNWA has 13 member communities. As a member of AFNWA, Tobik First Nation is aiming to manage their own water. Let's give, let's give our own people a try to run things. Because we know best. I mean, like, you know, that's how I see it anyway. So I said, I, for me personally, I feel like um, I know what goes on here better than anybody. The AFNWA is expected to be operational by 2020, and the model could be adapted to other regions. Angel Moore, APTN, National News, Chibuktuk, also known as Halifax. As I mentioned earlier, this whole project stemmed in part from an investigation in 2019 by an investigative research class at the First Nations University of Canada, led by instructor Patricia Elliott. Her students chose First Nations to research the history of the water infrastructure and the water quality. Ten students were awarded fellowships with the Institute for Investigative Journalism so they, they could continue on this work. And then, of course, by 2020, the Water Consortium grew to include six media outlets and 75 students from 10 colleges and universities. Joining us now are students from the First First Nations University, who were uh, a part of that original research, Jada Bowden Herney and Darla Panas, who I spoke with on Monday. Let's watch. We're so glad that both of you can join us to share how this all got underway. Jada, I'll start with you. You know, it was your class uh, that that ended up being the spark to this whole massive water project. Can you share with us what your class was doing? This is back in uh, 2019 that got all of this underway. Yeah, um, so in 2019, we had a research class that was led by uh, Patricia Elliott, Dr. Patricia Elliott, uh, in collaboration with the IIJ. Um, sorry. Um, they were in collaboration with the IIJ, which is the Institute for Investigative Journalism. Mm -hmm. um, we were a uh, First Nations University class with that, what we did was we started with research bases. So we tried to find a hypothesis and narrowed in on it. Uh, the biggest things that we did with that is we looked at water and water systems. There was research already done that had led to there was issues arising and the rising issues were based on systemic uh, colonialistic uh, policies that underfunded and and deteriorated uh, a lot of water systems and uh, through this research how we started it basically was a teamwork of a bunch of heads together and we focused on the Indian Act the policies that come with the Indian Act and uh, we just led from there 
Uh, Darla, I'll go to you. So this, you know, it's, it's not a, a surprise to anybody. Water is a huge issue in First Nations across this country. Um, you know, 10 students got internships out of this uh, to continue the work that had started at the university. Uh, then you find yourselves as, as students working alongside a huge network of partners, um, you know, heavy hitting journalists from across the country. You know, what are you thinking as this got underway? Um, so when I originally signed up for the class, I had no idea that it was a collaborative investigative class. Um, it was a shock to me to see the nationwide class um, when we went to class for the first day. Uh, and then we started to find out more about the water issues in First Nations communities. And it just, it was amazing, like finding out so much stuff about the issues that First Nations people had on, in their communities with their water sources. Well, and I mean, this is, uh, you know, something that I would say a lot of journalists in their entire careers won't be involved in a project of this magnitude. Uh, and this is how you're starting off. Jada, is it, you know, as you're watching this um, kind of roll out, this two years worth of work that's, that's all rolling out now, what are, what are you thinking, what are you feeling as, as you're kind of riding the wave? Yeah, riding the wave is the best way to put it. As the stories come out, I get more excited because uh, th this is the work that we started from day one. Uh, it came from a thought and then it just expanded through um, actually going one-on-one -on -one interviews with uh, water instructor or water operators, um, even First Nations people, individuals on um, just has a house that has these issues. People were talking about them. Um, I think the biggest thing that I got out of this is just the human stories um, and hearing them and trying to empower their voices, not kind of going in the direction of this is a bad thing that happened and we're victims, but more in the fact that we're persevering, like I'm talking as an Indigenous person, mm -hmm. uh, that we're persevering through these issues. And I feel like stories like this, the investigation is, is giving more power to these um, communities to help fix the systems. So I think the most exciting part about it is the fact that there's going to hopefully be real big policy changes in the next coming years and months coming up. Darla, I'll ask you the same question. You know, two years worth of a lot of work uh, go, went into this, a lot of hands uh, stirring this pot. Uh, as you're watching the rollout, what is your hope for the takeaway uh, from the public from all of this? I guess just the awareness that there is um, an issue still with First Nations people receiving clean water and that's that's a big thing you know some people don't have access to clean water and that's something that Canada really needs to take serious that there should be a national drinking water standard for all Canadian all people all over Canada yeah and I'll ask you Jada what's next for you where do you where do you want to, uh, I mean you're obviously a talented researcher both of you where do you guys hope that this takes takes you in the future Jada I'll start with you and then I'll go to Darla <laughs> Good question. Um, I'm actually working with a local tribal council um, and with this we're doing self-governance and um, for, like Indigenous sovereignty and that's kind of where I really want to focus my area of interest. Uh, this research empowered me in showing that there are these serious policy issues and gaps that are greatly infect, uh, affecting uh, First Nations communities. So for me, I need to feel like I can help my community through this work. And so um, just working for my tribal council and trying to advance our interests is my next steps, but I don't see myself stop writing mm. um, and advocating for Indigenous rights and everything about that comes with that. Darla, what's next for you? Um, my plan is to go to the U of R, or J school at the U of R, 
And then I don't want to stop here. I want to keep going with this investigative journalism. I really like the field work and um, collecting data and research. It's so fun uncovering some stuff. And Agreed. the more that you find out, the more that you want to know and the more you want to help the community and get the gain the truth for people. It's so true. I, I describe that. Lots of people say, you know, what do you love about journalism? And I would say, you know, it's kind of the same joy that you get that a dog gets digging up for bones, right? Like you, it's like, there it is. And what else can I find? And it's it's an addiction to, um, you know, just uncovering stuff and, and revealing it. And uh, well, I wish both of you guys all of the best in your future endeavors. A lot of uh, hard work went into this, lots of talent, and I look forward to following your careers. Darla, of course, don't forget, when you're ready to, uh, APTN's always looking for new reporters. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great to talk to them both on Monday. Well, we are all out of time for Clean Water Broken Promises on In Focus. Uh, major shout out to the team of researchers and journalists who worked on this incredible piece of investigative journalism and to P Patty Sontag and Annie Burns Piper who pulled this all together. Tune into APTN National News tonight for Brittany, Brittany Hobson's full story on how the water woes uh, are particularly like, effective, uh, affected during with these cisterns. That's on the news tonight. And uh, then tomorrow, uh, Priscilla Wolf explores uh, water issues in Saskatchewan First Nations. And you can check all of this out online, aptnnews.ca slash cleanwaterbrokenpromises. Thanks for joining us. I'm Melissa Ridgen, and we'll see you back here next week.